the reason why I like architecture is, um, you know, the end product and handing something over to somebody and having them be completely fulfilled and, and blown away. That's for me, that's, uh, that's the why for me is making a difference in the world through architecture and every chance we get, that's where we focus. Episode 141. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Clay Arell is a principal at AB Design Studio, an architecture firm based in Santa Barbara, California. He's been recognized locally and nationally as an influential leader in design and architecture. Today, Clay Arell shares how he and his partner, Josh Bloomer, have built AB Design Studio into an architecture firm recognized around the world for incredible design and client service. Well, Clay, welcome to Business of Architecture. Thank you very much. So, Clay, you're a principal at AB Design Studio. And just yes, give, me a, give me a background. First of all, let's go back to, to just your story so our audience can get familiar with who you are and how you got into architecture in the first place. So how far back would you like me to go? Well, I was thinking right after birth, maybe toddler stage. <laughs> <you know? laughs> just, just tell us about, you know, you went to school. Tell us about those early years. I always like to know what that, those early years were like for you when you went to school and then you got your first job. Tell us about that. Well, I'll back up a little more um, just because it's relevant. My my father was a contractor, general contractor, so I spent cool. summers working on job sites and reading plans and understanding uh, how to translate plans into, into buildings, frankly. So that that really started my, uh, my interest in architecture in high school. Uh, I was interested in architecture and engineering, so I, I figured I'd inter intern with an engineering firm over one summer in high school and then decided right away that I didn't want to be an engineer. Uh, so architecture was it. Why not? And um, I, uh, I, I ended up going to Cal Poly Pomona, mm. study architecture, got a Bachelor of Architecture there, and worked... Uh, in a few firms on the west side of LA for probably my last two years of school, uh, interning and and then working, and then um, ended up at one of the firms uh, following graduation. So I gra when I graduated college, I went to Europe for three months, did the whole backpack and Eurorail pass, uh, sketch pad, and that whole thing, and traveled through Europe. And uh, came back and, and started working. Well, tell us about AB Design Studio. What do you guys do? Um, well, we're multi multidisciplinary firm. Frankly, we've done a lot of uh, you know our, our main specialty is architecture, interior design, and urban planning. We've done other things as well related to furniture design, graphic design. Uh, we've been exploring the use of shipping containers and how to use uh, them as a building element and and or a building itself and um, we really focus our efforts on doing high quality architecture and good design. Um, we've done a range of projects on the residential side, commercial side, uh, ranging from restaurants to hotels. Uh, we're currently doing the Children's Museum here in Santa Barbara and uh, have done large corporate interiors for uh, companies like Sonos and uh, things like that. So we're we're pretty well uh, versed in different types of projects, but we really focus on a really good design process and putting out a good product. And what's the size of your firm? Uh, currently, we have an office headquarters here in Santa Barbara, California, and we have an office down in Los Angeles. Uh, between the two offices, we're about 20, 21 people. Okay. 
what was the impetus for AB Design Studio? Tell me about how you were obviously working for someone else, and then there came a point where now you're now you're a principal at AB Design Studio. How'd that happen? Well, I worked for um, several firms. I moved around a little bit just to get my experience level up and have the chance to work on different types of projects. And I worked for a few years with a good friend of mine at a firm here in Santa Barbara. Um, and I decided in 2003 that I wanted to move out and go out on my own, um, mostly because I always really wanted to do it. And I always wanted to uh, be my own boss, have my own clients. And uh, at that time of my life, what was really cr uh, critical for me was the ability to have control over my schedule, <laughs> if you will. And um, I did that for about two years. Uh, had my own company. I was running, running it with just myself and uh, eventually a couple interns. And then I started getting busier, and my friend that I was working with at the prior firm and I started talking and decided that we would partner up, and that's when we created AB Design Studio. And that was in July of 2005. So as firms go, your firm is rather rather young. I mean, what is it? It's 2015 now. You guys have been in business for, I guess it would be considered mid, you know, mid-lifespan. You guys have been in business for 10 years. Yeah, we celebrated 10 years July of this year. And you have, if I don't say so, a, an impressive array of projects during those 10 years. Uh, well, I appreciate the compliment. We, we definitely have, uh, you know, we rode the economy of 2005, 6, and 7 uh, up as it was really rocking and rolling. And then we also rode it down in the recession. Uh, and then in 2010, really began rebuilding and restructuring our company and have been really growing ever since. Yep. Tell me about those early days of starting the firm. What were some of the what were the challenges that you faced? Well, you know, um, when we started our firm in 2005, you know, we were, I guess you could say, the new kids on the block. Um, we were young, and uh, you know, we had a lot of energy, and we just kept marketing and marketing and marketing. And for us, it was about making connections with people doing really great projects, um, really bringing a high level of, of service and design to each project, and uh, really working hard to exceed our clients' expectations. Those are some of the tenants that we were really working with. And as we began to grow and, and, and hire people and... I wanna, I'm going to interrupt you just for a second. You said marketing, marketing, marketing. Clay, what, give me some examples. What were you doing to market your firm in those early days? Well, we didn't have a portfolio of much to speak of, so really it was, uh, you know, it was based on people we knew, connections we made. We spent a lot of time with real estate brokers, uh, commercial brokers, residential side. Uh, we spent a lot of time with general contractors, uh, really just getting out there, making sure people knew who we were, if they didn't already know us, uh, and what we were doing and why we were doing it. So are we talking cold calls in the office or these are warm contacts that you already knew, taking them out to lunch. Let me know, what, what did that network building look like? A little bit of both. Um, you, you know, definitely people that we knew that we had either built projects with in the past uh, or we had real estate agents that we knew. We would take them to lunch, sit down with them, show them what we're up to, talk about the firm, talk about what our goals are. Um, see how we could assist them and be of service to them in any way. We looked at commercial properties for people before they sign leases and, and try to help people understand what they can and cannot do with buildings uh, in, in, in a pro bono situation, just to make sure that you know we're getting our name in there and if somebody signed a lease and we'd be part of that discussion. So really it was a lot of that and there was some cold calling. We would you know, we'd finish a project, we'd send out postcards to a bunch of people that we knew, we'd send letters and just really introduce ourselves to people in the market. And uh, you typically the industries of, of the general contractors and the real estate brokers were the, the main focus. 
how did the pro bono work work out for you? You said you would sounds like you would do a little bit of needs analysis for them, or kind of tell them what they can do with a certain property on a b- pro bono basis. Did that did that land any any good projects for you? Um, yeah, it did. It landed a lot of great projects. Um, you know, on the residential side, if if somebody was looking to buy a house and they wanted to know how much they could add on, what it would cost, you know, are, are they able to put a second story on? We would work with the realtor and the potential homeowner to assess that and help them understand what they're getting into. Um, and we would look at multiple properties from time to time so that, you know, they would be able to make a choice between A, B, or C. Um, so we were part of that discussion a lot. And, and likewise, on the commercial side, leasing side, you know, if a tenant wanted to look at an office space and they needed 5,000 square feet, we'd help them understand that maybe they only need 4,000 square feet or maybe they actually need 6,000 square feet um, prior to signing a lease and getting committed for a five-year term or, or, or beyond. So, you know, really just kind of high-level space needs analysis, some budgeting to help people get comfortable with, uh, you know, moving forward, either purchasing a home or signing a lease. And for us, it was, you know, bringing our expertise and our knowledge to an area where people tended to need support. Mm-hmm. Is that pro bono service? Is that a service you still offer? We do it quite a bit with people. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been something that we enjoy to do. Um, we've never formalized it as a as a service that we um, advertise, but we definitely uh, have relationships with people and. When they need something, we'll we'll be there and we'll do it, and they don't get an invoice. So when it comes up, you do it. Yeah. Is is do they get an invoice at all that says, "Hey, here's the invoice, but it's discounted and the payment due is zero? Or what kind of do you have any process for closing the loop of saying, "Hey, you know what? We just provided you with something really valuable." No, we usually talk about it up front. You know, talk about a little bit about how we would typically bill for this, but we're not going to, you know, we're not going to bill any any time for this type of service. And what we're really looking for forward to is getting their business when they decide to sign papers or pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. Clay, in those early years, what would you say was your number one challenge? Well, I think the number one challenge was growth. Um, and, and I think in any small firm that starts out with two guys, you know, architects starting a firm, you know, usually it's about the architecture and it's about uh, the design and it's about serving clients and, and doing a good product. That's what we all focus on. Um, but there's a business aspect of it. And I think when you start, when you're two guys who are controlling everything and running the running the office and have all the ideas and have, you know, bringing all the design forward and you start growing, um, you know, you get to three or four or five people, um, you know, it seems fairly manageable, but then you start to grow past that and it, that's where it becomes a little bit more challenging. You need a little bit more infrastructure. There's a little bit more managerial task that needs to happen. Um, I noticed when we were growing from four people total to nine people total, um, the, the challenging part was, you know, who does what and who's accountable for what part of the project and how do we manage it all the way through the process so that the, you know, the schedule and the scope and the budget are all in sync. And that was really the hardest part in that. Le- that was the hardest learning curve, I think, for us in the very beginning stages of our company. And how did you overcome that? Um, I don't know if you ever really overcome it. I think it's always, you know, it's always there a little bit. Um, but my my partner uh, and I have done a lot of work with business coaches, uh, a lot of work with seminars, and we do a lot of research around that so that we can understand that there's other ways to do it. Um, involved with business groups that, you know, where companies have grown from 20 to 50 to 100 and use them as resources to, uh, understand how we might grow in that, you know, have that kind of expansion. Um, so, you know, really it's, it's a lot of uh, researching, understanding, listening, and, and getting coaching from people who have either done it or understand how to do it. Mm-hmm. How did you connect with these groups and coaches that helped you out? 
Uh, well, currently, my my business partner and I are involved with Vistage, which is a national uh, kind of a business owners group. Um, and we got connected through some people we knew who were just asking around and wanted to know who, you know, we were looking for something to get involved with. And then that Vistage kept coming up. So we sought it out and got involved. Um, my partner and I have also done a lot of work with Landmark Education, which is a seminar company that puts on um, programs about how to deal with whatever you're dealing with in life, uh, whether it be personal, business, spiritual, anything, frankly. Uh, we've done a lot of coursework and seminars inside of that that world, um, which has been great. And inside of there, we met connections with people who have branched out from that company and, and really support businesses and corporations in, in, in their, their owners in a very direct and focused way. Um, so we've, we sought those types of avenues out and it's been very successful for us. Mm -hmm. What would you say would be some of the top takeaways that have really helped you and your business partner out, things that you've gained from Vistage or Landmark or any other resources? Oh, I think one of the number one takeaways for us, and we, you know, it took us probably maybe three or four years into the business, uh, maybe more, maybe it was around 2010. You know, when when my partner and I started, it was really about we were kind of we tended to do the same thing. We, we were both architects. We wanted to do, um, you know, we're doing the design work and we're doing the marketing and we're doing the meetings and we're running every aspect of the business in a, in a very collaborative and 50-50 fashion. Uh, what we started to do and, and we started to become aware of through coaching and, and whatnot is that we really needed to divide and conquer. In other words, we decided to sit, we sat down at one point and went through a list of all the things that we're doing on a daily basis and divvied them up between the two of us and said, okay, well, I don't like doing that, but you really like doing it, so why don't you do that part and I'll do this part because you hate this part. Um, so, you know, when we did that, we split it up. We, we split some of the major accountabilities up, like, you know, office managerial accounting and financial and HR went to one person, marketing and business development went to another. Um, but the one thing that we always came together on uh, was designed. So we, we made sure that we held on to a very collaborative studio environment um, and that we would always sit down on projects together and put our heads together and design because we truly believe then and do now that that uh, you know, two heads are better than one when it comes to putting out a good product. And we promote that in our studio even today with 20 people. We're constantly getting people around the the table or getting people on a pinup session so that we can get other ideas out on the table and, and work through a design problem uh, that somebody could sit at their desk for two or three days struggling with. And we, we try to get those things done in a, in a very quick fashion. So what do you like best about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, good question because it moves around so much. Um, but I think the, the reason why I like architecture is, um, you know, the end product and handing something over to somebody and having them be completely fulfilled and, and blown away. That's for me, that's, uh, that's the why for me is making a difference in the world through architecture and every chance we get, that's where we focus. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that an everyday phenomenon? No, it's not an everyday phenomenon, but it's definitely something that I'm striving for every day and looking for in every project, whether it's a small uh, you know, retail space or a large museum. We're, we're constantly looking for how does this, is this going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. How do most of your projects come to you right now, currently, in terms of what channel? <clears throat> Um, you know, a large percentage is, is referral base and repeat clients. That's generally the largest percentage. Um, we also get a lot of uh, referrals from um, uh, local brokers and real estate brokers. We still get a lot from there. We tend to get quite a bit of people either find us on the web or find us through other social media channels um, or have just 
seen our work and sought us out. That happens from time to time. So we get it from a lot of different angles, but primarily it's referral base or repeat clients. Okay. Do you do any active marketing besides, I mean, you mentioned social media, you mentioned the website. Do you do any other sort of paid advertising or taking out ads in trade publications? Um, over the years, we've done uh, various degrees of that. We've sponsored events. Um, we've done some paid advertising. We've done advertorials that kind of, you know, here's a, uh, a story about your company or a project that we're generally paying for. Um, we've recently, as of, I don't know, the past year, really taken a bigger look at into social media. And um, we've recently hired a business development manager who is really taking on more social media, LinkedIn, and, and other aspects of that. Um, we're working on a new website currently that should launch by the end of this year. Um, so we're, we're always actively doing that. We, we, we don't like to, we haven't found a lot of success in, in paid advertising, um, generally speaking, but a lot, a lot of, we have done it in the past, but we tend to, we tend to get out there more in, in with people. And I think that's where the, it's the personal contact. I think that makes the biggest difference. Yep. Absolutely. Well, so you and Josh have been partners now for 10 years, like you said, just recently. Congratulations on that milestone. Thank you. What are some, tell me if you have any tips about what to look for in a partner. What are some things that you think are important to look for? Um, well, that's a good question. I think many people have said, had said to us in the early beginnings uh, that it's really challenging, it's very difficult. And I, I think that that rings true in many cases. What we've noticed, at least with Josh and myself, you know, I, I, really I think the key to our success is that we're friends. Um, we've been best friends for, you know, close to 17 years now. Um, we really put our, each other and each other's families first. So it's, it may sound a little cheesy and it's not intended to, but we're really, we really make sure that the other person and the other person's family is taken care of and then the business is just second. It's an, it's an avenue to support it, but it's not the primary thing. And when we focus on, if I'm not focused on myself and I'm focused on him, then it's, it's not about me anymore and it's really about uh, a bigger conversation. And I think that's really been a key to our partnership because there have been bumpy roads and there have been frustrating times and there have been upsets and, and uh, challenges between us on a, not usually on a partnership level, but let's say something's going sideways on a project and he has a viewpoint and I have a viewpoint. It's easy to get into loggerheads, but we have continually looked at it from a lens of, okay, what's best for the project or what's best for the business or what's best for, uh, for each other and how do we get through this together? And I think that really stood out during 2008, 2009, when the economy was not that great and we were all feeling the, the pressure and he and I stood together arm in arm and figured out how to get through it. And that probably made us stronger partners than any other experience we've had to date. Mm. Uh, but really, it comes down primarily to, I think for us, it's our friendship and our families are first and the business is second. Have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more.
And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.